All right, peace and welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Raji Mahami. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Folks, we got a lot to talk about. As we first talk about this Supreme Court case, which shows that there might be some issues with this loophole, quote unquote, and this obstruction case that the Supreme Court is looking at as it relates to the January 6th rioters. We're going to look at that have that conversation. Also, Rainbow Push leader, Dwayne, uh, uh, Pastor Haynes has officially resigned only after three months, leaving many questions and no answers. We'll talk about the impact that it has. Also, later on, we're going to talk about how some Black University of Florida alumni wants the university to reinstate the, uh, DEI policies to help and continue to empower Black students. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then later on, folks, let's talk about Black Maternal Health Week. We're going to check in with one sister who's doing the work of making sure that Black women are supported during their time of pregnancy. Folks, stay with us. a whole lot to get you on today's edition of The Culture right here on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Folks, welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Happy Wednesday, folks. Happy Wednesday. Today is Wednesday, April the 17th. And I thank you so much for being with me on this hump day as we have a lot of conversations lined up for you. But before we get to the discussions, we got to let you know, folks, that we are streaming on a number of different places and spaces. And first, Make sure y'all check us out on our home platform of blackstarnetwork.com. Make sure you check our website there. You can download the app for free on any of your devices. And then more importantly, follow us on social media at Black Star Network and put something in a little something in the bucket to help us to continue to power us and fund us in this digital space so we can continue to have the conversations that are most important to you. So just you can do all of that at blackstarnetwork.com. Now, folks, we're also streaming on Amazon platforms. So make sure you check us out there on Amazon News on your Fire TV. You can also find us on the Amazon Prime Video app and just find us on the Prime Video app under Live TV, the news, or find us on Amazon.com under Prime Video, the Live TV, the news. We're also streaming on the Free V, Free v Network, excuse me. Uh, you can find us on now under News for Black Star Network, as well as Plex TV. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can find search for Black Star Network or find us on the Live TV and their uh, news and opinions. Now, we're also streaming on Big Brother Roland Martin's social media pages on his Facebook page, as well as on his YouTube channel. And big shout out to the online culture crew, the great culture crew. That's right, for always checking in, being a part of the conversations on all of those spaces, on the X platform, on Facebook, and on YouTube. We certainly appreciate each and every one of them for being with us today. And uh, we thank you so much for all of you for your continued support. And if you are not familiar with how this thing goes, it's very simple, folks. You jump in the chat, we hear what you gotta say. We bring your conversations to the forefront of the discussions on air. And that way, this is a whole interactive experience for the culture here on the Black Star Network as I check in and talk to the guests, talk to you, and let's just keep the conversation going. So big shout out to the online culture crew. Let me see who is in here. We got the Stephanie Humphrey channel, the ABX girl, Deidre Hall, I see you. Pastor Damon Blissett, I see you. Arlene Starks, I see you. Brian Christian, I see you. Who else we got? Wild Democrat, nut job. Oh, wow, there we go, my guy. Thank you for checking in. And so many of you are checking in. Um, and I appreciate each and every one of you. And in a few moments, I'm going to bring my sister in. It's Wednesday. Y'all know how we do on Wednesdays? My sister, she is the host of the Suzette Speaks show. She is a licensed attorney out of the state of Florida. She is a political contributor here on Black Star Network here on the Culture, Roland Martin and Filter. And she is the host. Come on. I'm going to I'm going to have I love I love this part. Let me bring my sister in. Suzette Speaks is checking in with me as always on Wednesday. Suzette Thank you hey. so much. Suzette, let's, let's drop it because it is, I think it's launch time or something. Isn't it go time for uh, 
for the show in the down in at South Florida. Give us the deets on that. What's the deets? Yes, there? it's always a pleasure to be with my peoples here <laughs> at the culture. But yes, Faraji, I'm grateful. Thank you for the shout out. I have begun a journey here in Miami as a host on an FM radio show called Come on, the there we go. Show Live. Shout out to me, yay! <laughs> <laughs> on a Caribbean American talk uh, slash music uh, uh, stations, or actually it's a family of stations from Miami, North Miami, Hollywood, up to Fort Lauderdale, Vero Beach, Port St. Lucie, Stewart, all the way up to Orlando. And I'll be doing a talk show every Thursday and Friday from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. live. So if you follow me, please uh, listen in. Thursdays and Fridays, midday chick, they say, something like that. And um, bringing on interesting guests, you know, we do it for the culture. So I'm grateful for the shout out, the Voice of the Caribbean, I and I Radio, let's go. There um, we go. Voice of the Caribbean Carolina. in South Florida. There yes, we go. so listen in, tune in. I appreciate the love. Thank you so oh, much for absolutely. There we go. There we go. Yay. <laughs> hey, look, 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 real quick, real quick. When yes. I tuned in, I think it was Jay I think you were talking to a sister about housing or I think it was, but it was like a couple of days ago and I didn't realize you have a serious Caribbean accent. Hey, it's in there. It's in there. Now, obviously I was like, wait me. a minute. Hold it's up. It, it, it kicked out. I was like, oh, Suzette speaks and Suzette speaks. <laughs> Morning Kingston, baby. It's in there. It's in there. But yeah, we, we mix it up. Of course, again, that that uh, particular platform is, uh, is designed for the Caribbean awesome. American experience. So like me, uh, daughter of immigrants, many of us have different languages spoken. Of course, we love, you know, the, the blackness, the diasporaness of of what it means to be part American, part of your uh, old co country's culture. But yeah, we mix it up. So I I, I do a Love lot it. of interviews with Caribbean American people and it's really fun. So it's I lovely. hope you enjoy Don't let, let me, don't let the code switch uh, scare you any. It's, it's in No, nah. <laughs> no, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I enjoy and that's how I talk with them with my people. So, hey, get to know me. There it is. There it is. My sister Suzette speaks as always. All right, look, we're going to take a quick pause. When we come forward, we're going to jump right into some conversation. Let's first, let's talk about what the Supreme Court, why they are skeptical, skeptical, excuse me, about uh, a particular law that may be a loophole. Uh, and it may lead to some January 6th rioters not being held fully accountable for their actions on that fateful day. So stay with us. That conversation comes up next here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! I'm a real um, revolutionary right now. I thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Raji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. Oh, man, we got a lot to cover. So I'm joined by my sister, Suzette Speaks, um, kicking off today's discussions. Let's first talk about the Supreme Court. And they had that big, big um, case review yesterday, Suzette. And uh, the word is coming out of Washington, D.C., that they appear to be more divided uh, around this issue about this, uh, whether January 6th rioters actually broke the law um, on, on January 6th, 2021, when they stormed the Capitol and that if they truly uh, disrupted congressional business, 
Uh, and this is a law really rooted in obstruction. And what some people are saying, legal scholars and political scholars and scientists are saying, that at the root of this, this could be the one case that uh, opens it up, whether Trump himself may find to be, um, you know, being held liable for what we saw on January the 6th. I want to share just a little bit from the reporting from NPR, and then, uh, Suzette, get your take on this. But take a look at this, folks. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court appeared divided on Tuesday with conservatives expressing various degrees of skepticism about the statute used to prosecute more than 350 people involved with the January 6th riot at the Capitol, at least partially on the line at Tuesday's argument, was the Justice Department's effort to punish some of those it deems the most serious participants in the Capitol riot. Roughly one quarter of those prosecuted so far for their roles in the Capitol invasion have been charged with violating a federal statute enacted after the Enron scandal in, 20, in 2002, a scandal that involved massive document shredding and fraud. Uh, Suzette, break it down for us like, like we're in elementary school right. here. Which, which, which is, is, it, it, is my understanding of this being that at the root of this is whether this is a form of obstruction. Is that at the root of this case or is there something else here? No, you're right, Faraji. Thank you for that recap. So basically we have one of the January 6th uh, defendants who have has brought this particular argument forward and the Supreme Court in oral arguments yesterday decided to hear it and just, it's very interesting, y'all. You can hear the audio. Of course, no cameras are allowed inside the Supreme Court uh, during arguments, but they are recorded and you can hear them online on YouTube, anywhere you look. But Joseph Fisher, Fisher, who was a former police officer who participated in the January 6th riot on the Capitol uh, that was trying to prevent the peaceful passage of power from Donald Trump, who lost the election to Joe Biden, as we recall, uh, was one of those folks caught on the Capitol. And he uh, was a part of all of the the uh, the I would just call it the invasion of the Capitol that we saw. So the argument is being made now uh, on his behalf, but as you stated, it will affect almost everybody, including the president, if this argument uh, stands. So it has gone through the appeals process. People are asking like, why hasn't this been decided before? Well, it kind of worked its way through the court system as it should take some time. But what he's arguing is that the statute that is being used to uh, has been used to successfully convict, as you said, over 350 people of obstruction, uh, that it is not properly being applied. And why is he saying that? As you stated, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which is where this is coming from, was passed in 2002 in the wake of the Enron scandal. And if people are too young and don't remember what Enron was, it was a horrible, um, uh, what could I call it, implosion of a business where during that time, in order to cover up their tracks, a lot of the executives, people, had, you know, that top tier that worked there, started shredding a bunch of documents and trying to hide things from the feds. So the argument is being made that when this was written, it was not intended to imply that obstruction could mean physical obstruction. The argument is being made that obstruction only applies to documents. Now, this is a the key kind of interpretation and, and whether or not it will go one way or another is what this hinges on. So, for example, President Trump might not therefore be excluded because he had uh, involvement in the uh, allegedly in the fake electors scheme, which was sending documents to and from the Capitol to try to get people who were not the real electoral college members to uh, certify that these were the electoral co college votes. So he has kind of like a document implication. But for the other defendants, they're trying to say that the Justice Department has too broadly interpreted this particular statute. Now, this is taking me back to law school where we're looking at, you know, with the what they say, the plain letter of the law. What does it say on its face? What do those words on that paper mean? Then you also look at what was uh, going on when it was written. What was Congress's intent when they wrote this law? And of course, like I said, it was during the Enron scandal Handle, and then it really was specifically to try to prevent people from when they were involved in kind of obstruction of an inv investigation uh, from destroying documents. However, there's one word in the statute uh, that kind of in the oral arguments yesterday, you could hear uh, Justice Kagan, you could hear others kind of go back and forth on whether or not otherwise obstruct or I'm, I'm paraphrasing any other behavior falls into that words otherwise obstruct uh, 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 proceeding. Mm. So 
uh, or some kind of federal proceeding. So when you look at that otherwise, it is kind of uh, up for interpretation, which is why it's in front of the Supremes, whether or not that means behavior beyond what the uh, original intent of the law was, which was kind of document space. And then you heard in questioning uh, from all justices uh, you know, does that mean if there was a peaceful protest outside of, you know, uh, some sort of federal proceeding, would that be obstruction? And you've heard one side state, no, the Justice Department has never used it in that uh, way. And there's no reason to believe they will. And then others are saying, you know, where is the line drawn? And it, uh, other Supreme Court justices are saying, where is the line drawn? Are we now going to allow for an extension of this uh, 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 law that was not the original intent of the law? So that's right. the argument that's being had. And so we have, a, again, very divided Supreme Court. Conservative yeah. justices in some of their questioning sound somewhat sympathetic to the idea that this law could have been overly applied, too far applied. What would that mean? Remember, as you just uh, pointed out from the NPR piece, over 1,400 people have already been uh, charged. 350 yep. with this particular statute applied to their charges, including Mr. Trump, where two of his uh, uh, charges stem from this statute that uh, the case with Jack Smith. So it has totally put a pause on the January 6th case as it relates to uh, Donald Trump, but it also may affect the people who have already been convicted, depending on how the Supreme Court rules, it could definitely shorten their sentences. Some people may not even go to jail on this particular charge if they're saying that it was too broadly applied to the crimes committed on committed on January 6th. That is crazy. Look, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, we'll continue the conversation with Suzette. I want to get your take on this crew, post your thoughts as we're streaming live on uh, Big Brother Roland Martin's Facebook page and on his YouTube channel. I would love to hear what you have to say as we talk about the case of the Supreme Court. Uh, kind of skeptical. They, they heard the opening arguments in this case re regarding the January 6th obstruction law and whether it's, as you heard Suzette say, be being applied too broadly. That could possibly lead to getting some rioters to have to walk. This could happen. Wow. Want to hear what you got to say. Stay with us. We still got a lot more to cover in this first half of the show here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. State of the Union 2024, huge night for President Joe Biden. This was a CBS receipts type of night. Yes. He dragged the hell out of the Supreme Court. And he said, <laughs> y'all don't see the power of women. Trump's brain is melting as we speak. We want to organize from a place of strength. There's no confusion whatsoever about what they've done and what they plan to do. What Donald Trump is doing is presenting a fallacy. He is convincing them that he's all in it for them when in fact he's all in it for himself. We do not feel Joe Biden in spite of the success that have taken place during this administration economically. There are too many things where we do not feel like he's had our back. You should also be investing in the barbershops and the beauty salons and the hookah bars and the folks who are going to the club and there's a way to actually get them registered because we've done it before. But if you don't have folks who understand that dynamic, then you're missing a big opportunity. So we said we just celebrated. For what? Why did you go to sell and to celebrate rather than recommit yourself to the fight if the very thing we went to celebrate has been gutted? Republicans did not support a lot of the bills that were necessary to keep the country fluid. You can't only love your country when you win, right? right. Oh, no. You guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? This was absolutely the knockdown drag out that we were really waiting Black for. voters are the base. They're the most important base of the Democratic Party. There was very few language in this speech at the time we see an attack on black history, an attack on DEI. The end of the BLM racial reckoning thing has come to a complete end because there was nothing in this speech for that. Our movement 
has never been grounded in two-party politics in this country. All of our movements ultimately get co-opted by a state that is anti-black. They called the old because they knew the way, and they called the young because they were strong. And I believe there is a good combination of that, but we can have ideas and we can have visions and dreams, but we have to have our young people also working beside us because they are strong, and they will run that race, and they will run it to the end. Activists, organizers, and young people have been pushing this administration to be on the right side of history and to do something about the issues that they care about. While the Ukraine and Palestine are critical issues. They are not the only global issues. Not a single black person who should ever let it come out their mouth that I'm tired. Because there is somebody else who came before us who didn't stop fighting. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, joined by my sister, Suzette Speaks, licensed attorney, uh, media host, as well as political contributor here on Black Star uh, Network. As we talk about the case of uh, January 6th writers, rioters, and how SCOTUS is now in the process of reviewing one case that may create a domino effect of whether others who were involved in the storming of the Capitol maybe uh, either looking at jail time, being prosecuted, or maybe sent home. And that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the stakes. That's how high the stakes are in this particular situation. But going back to what you explained and uh, giving us some context on what the Supreme Court is looking at, um, Suzette, I'm wondering, is this another way? And I mean, is by the Supreme Court being so super conservative, how much does that play into this decision making? Is this coming down to the law or is this coming down to you know, partisan politics? I, I do think it will come down to probably legal ideology because when okay. we look at this, like the Supreme Court, once again, is supposed to be nonpartisan, even though they get appointed by obviously a Democrat or a Republican president. It is supposed to look at the law and apply the law to the facts of the case. Now, in the questioning, you could just see the uh, ideological divide. So you have Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson asking, you know, if this is not obstruction, you're trying to stop the 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 proceeding that you know allows for a, a presidential election to be certified. What is it if this is not obstruction on its face? And you have you know Justice Soto Mayor saying. Maybe this hasn't been applied before because we've never had a January 6th before. Right. Uh, you had on the other side, the more conservative side, you had Justice Neil Gorsuch asking questions during hearings yesterday, um, somewhat uh, like um, if a sit-in were to disrupt disrupt a trial, like I said, at a federal courthouse, would that apply? To which uh, some people in the audience heckled him. And you had other questions. <laughs> Uh, that stated like you know has this been this law been applied before and they were like yes there's been several cases where the justice department based on you know uh, destru destruction of documents and and tampering with evidence this has been something that has been utilized before this is not a unique uh, uh, instance where they're applying it to obstruction but again it, it, again it goes to to me legal philosophy what you're yeah. looking at what the intent of the writers of the law meant what it says on what they call textualist what does the text actually say so they're gonna run into a problem because it says otherwise in there or otherwise disrupt a uh, proceeding so does this behavior fit in that otherwise is what is open to interpretation but uh yes the 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 conservative bent that we see on the uh, our national bench right <laughs> where on the supreme court we have six known to be more conservative justices versus three uh, much more. Some people would just say moderate, not even liberal, which is moderate people. Right, right, um, right. It did, it did seem from the questioning at length that there is an ide ideological divide as to how this was interpreted and if it was interpreted properly. Um, hey. by, so remember also on the DC bench, uh, the Court of Appeals, remember you have the trial court, the lower court, then it gets appealed. On that appellate court, the four, 14 out of the 15 justices uh, before it went up to the Supremes, agreed with the Justice Department's interpretation of the law. You had one who was uh, hearing this defendant's case, 
who disagree with the interpretation. So you even see across uh, that that appeals court, the D.C. appeals court, there was kind of uh, a unanimity in terms of how this was interpreted, saying, like, of course, this would include this type of obstructive behavior. But you have only one judge who now questioned it. And that is what allowed it to now be appealed. And the Supreme Court had agreed to hear it. And so we yeah. should have a decision on what this actually means. And if it was uh, this law was appropriately apply to the January 6th defendants as it relates to obstruction. Now, Mr. Trump has more than just an obstruction charge, and so do many of the others. But with regards to that particular charge, it might, you even had um, one defendant, he was released out on like bail in anticipation for this uh, ruling. This also stops the, the trial that uh, John, uh, excuse me, Judge Tanya Chutkin had scheduled to begin uh, very shortly. Now we're on hold again to see what the outcome might be. So we're expecting a ruling as late as June and uh, whether it allows enough time for this case, the Trump January 6th case being prosecuted by Special Prosecutor Jack Smith to commence and be heard before the election yeah. in November is quite unlikely. So it depends on you know, what this ruling will say. But yeah, I think there's an ideological divide on our court right now. Wow, wow. All right, let's go to the crew. Damon, Pastor Damon Blissett, my brother, you said for Raji Suzette, this sounds similar to the Crown Act in to, uh Crown Act law in Texas. These laws are, are these laws are either too broad or too narrow, and they keep finding these loopholes. You agree or disagree with that? I, I, I think that uh Pastor Damon is up to uh, onto something when it comes Good to point, looking yeah. at why, you know, again, we have 14 other justices or appeals court judges that had agreed, yes, this is clearly trying to obstruct a federal proceeding. You know, no interpretation or misinterpretation uh, uh, was was um, was um, uh, in any way kind of detected according to those appeals judges. But you just take one, that's what, I think it's more akin to like what's happening in the, the uh, abortion cases where you're finding that judge that might have an, a sympathetic, sympathetic ideology to what your outcome will be. And once you find that one judge and then it gets appealed and then it gets appealed, it ends up in the lap of the Supreme Court. So I do think there are some similarities when it comes to uh, what we call forum shopping, looking for judges who might uh, agree with you ideologically and therefore allowing you to get another bite at the apple for it to go up to the next level of courts, the appeals court, and then hopefully make it to the Supreme Court as this particular ch case has now uh, made it there. And like I said, the arguments have been heard. You can listen to it for yourself and see which judges asked what. And I think that will uh, tell you a lot about the, right. the division among the Supreme Court justices. Absolutely. Cindy D asked the question, Suzette, could the rioters get retried without that provision? Uh, there is, I, unless they find another law that seemingly the facts of the case, the acts they committed would qualify under another federal law uh, to the extent of which they could apply um, some sort of standard of obstruction, possibly. I think if there was another federal law, and there could be, I, I'm, again, I'm not in the federal courts practicing actively, um, they might have applied it, but maybe they didn't think they needed to go um, you know, two steps because this one, which was written in 2002, was just, you know, there and had been applied to many other cases as, you know, recent as uh, just in the last uh, couple of years. So it is possible. I think what is going to happen, though, the people who are currently charged and have not pleaded guilty, because what happened is a lot of those people under that obstruction charge pled guilty. So yeah. if it goes the other way, they could be released um, retried again, depend, we can't have double jeopardy. Obviously it can't be under the same law. Uh, but it would, I, I don't know how, and again, what other possible federal, uh, statutes could apply. Uh, but we're not supposed to have double jeopardy right. if, um, if convicted or, or tried on a, a specific, um, statute. So that's to say if they found a new statute to apply, uh, possibly possibly, but if it goes the other way where the Supreme Court rules that it was too broadly applied and that this yeah. law was not intended to mean every uh, act of, uh, of obstruction up until writing, it just meant document destruction. <laughs> I don't know if that is, you know, again, reasonable to look at the, the 
the, the text of the law. What does it say? What do the words obstruction mean? You yeah. know, and that word otherwise also yeah. uh, in the statute, otherwise having disrupted uh, a, and I'm paraphrasing, a federal proceeding, does what they did fit in that otherwise? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know, Miss Cindy, that, that will be left to be seen. But I think it will if it's going in the direction and the Supreme Court does rule that this was an overextension of this particular law. A lot of people are going to um, have their jail sentences cut or not maybe face um, any uh, convictions on this particular charge. But they may find other charges for them. Wow. <laughs> I know it has a broad, I'm talking, and then it will be two. I think uh, Mr. Trump has two obstruction, but Jack Smith has other charges right. as well. But again, if it goes that way, it may drop those obstruction charges as applied at, at, by this law. Yeah. But again, yeah. they might be able to find some different um, case law or statutes to apply. So we'll that see. is crazy. That yeah. is crazy. It is going to be upheaval. It's huge. If they this this is like, crazy. This yeah. is crazy. All right. Uh, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, let's switch gears a little bit from talking about the uh, situation of the January 6th rioters and talking about another breakdown where we're going to give you some of the latest news around uh, the uh, the re resignation of Rainbow Push leader, uh, Pastor Haynes. And what happened? He was only in the position for three months. And now he decided to walk away. We'll have that conversation up next. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. I need you to scream for your new beginning. Five, four, three, two. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Peace and welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraj Muhammad, joined by my sister Suzette Speaks as we talk about the big conversations that folks are having. Uh, Suzette, I'm trying to figure out what is yes, going on. <laughs> what is going on? All right. So yesterday, uh, Brother Roland, he talked a little bit about this, um, the fact that uh, Dallas pastor, uh, Fred, Dr. Frederick Haynes III, who serves as the senior pastor of a church in North Texas, he was he was appointed to be in the, the leadership role for Rainbow Push Coalition. He has officially stepped down from that leadership, only being on the job for about three months. After three months, he decided to, uh, to step down. This is what the pastor said in the statement that he made. Take a look at this, folks. Um, he made the mention that he made, the, he made the surprise attendant announcement on Tuesday, yesterday, saying he would be leaving the new job. He said in his statement last year, when Reverend Jackson, a personal hero icon, a leader who has changed the world, 
tapped me to succeed him as president and CEO of Rainbow Push. It's been my honor to serve, and 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 for that, I will all would also be grateful. However, today I submitted my resignation as president and CEO. He said that he will continue to honor the work of Rainbow Push and Reverend Jackson and look forward to working together with them. Huh? Grand opening, grand closing. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> so when I saw it come down, I was on Instagram and I seen it come on um, Roland's feed and I was like, what? Like I literally Wait, stopped and was like, what, what is Serious. The thing about it, though, is that he doesn't give us a reason as to why he decided to step down. It's only been three months. Now, of course, Rainbow Bush accepted the resignation, but what was that? Yeah. It's a lot of speculation, so we both have to be very careful. I know that I am know, being all we very know careful. is what I am it's careful. Been said. But we're not on the inside, of course, and we respect uh, the uh, Reverend Jackson, and his iconic role and what he has done to move us as a people forward. Of course, uh, it is not a secret looking at uh, Reverend Jackson that he unfortunately was on the you know decline as far as his health. And it was there was a need to transition to new leadership. Um, I think this has opened up the door to a bigger conversation. I know uh, Brother Roland Martin went and, you know, he can say stuff that I can't when it comes right, to right, right. looking at this because he knows the folks. He knows uh, uh, Dr. Haynes and 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 the, and the and, uh, Reverend Jackson and the like. You know, these are folks who, are, you know, are my heroes. But it, it does open a kind of conversation when it comes to transition of leadership, especially uh, when it comes to our Black kind of historic organizations and do we have the openness when it comes to new leadership in allowing them to pursue their vision for the organization in other words are we prepared to transition when it comes time uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, whether it's our historically black uh, fraternities and sororities when it comes to, you know, NAACP and other civil rights organizations. And when it's time to see that generational shift, sometimes we see a lot of pushback. And I guess I could just speak of it in terms of what I've seen, just in terms of um, uh, uh, jobs and the careers that we all seek. I hear stories all the time when it comes to our millennial and Gen Z uh, feeling as if maybe our, you know, our older counterparts are not necessarily ready for us or open to us when it comes time to pass a torch. And I think this has been talked about when it comes to Congress, even as an institution yeah. and, and the Congressional Black Caucus. Again, our, yeah. our, our heroes are still serving right well into their 80s. And the conversation around, you know, when is it appropriate and are we seeing an openness to allow for the next generation to step forward, right? When it comes to local office, when it comes to national office, when it comes to private business, and when it comes to historically uh, uh, um, uh, storied civil rights organizations, are we ready for this conversation? You know, we, we've seen uh, what, what Reverend Jackson has done, but it, it's well into his, you know, senior years before we've seen a transition. And now, uh, for uh, a gentleman like the distinguished Dr. Freddie Haynes, who has served, mind you, 53 years at his church. So he don't have a problem with longevity and commitment. Right. So just to put that out there, the Friendship West Baptist Church, he has been the senior pastor there for, for a very long time, since 1983. So looking at that, um, at, uh, excuse me, Reverend Jackson has served the uh, or the organization was founded 50 years ago. But Freddie Haynes has served since 1983 because I'm like, oh, that's not 50 years, but it's a good amount of time. Is what right, I'm saying. right, right. We got the point you. being, we don't know what happened behind closed doors, right? We don't know what really is being exchanged. But there is a, I think Brother Roland highlighted it, that there might have been some tension between the old guard and the new guard. And when, with, when it comes to, and this is speculative, uh, Reverend Jackson, you know, maybe the people around him not being ready for new leadership and allowing someone else to take the helm well, and again lead the organization how and to where they think the the, the best vision will be for the organization so that i don't know it's a, it's a bigger conversation now is it, you know what though it's i'm so happy that one 
that we can we're, that we're having the conversation. And I think you're hitting the nail on the head, Suzanne. And I think you and I, in particular, we have been in probably enough spaces, enough rooms in our respective work, right, where we have seen this hesitation from the old guard transitioning into the new guard. I know I have. I I've have seen this in. They no, don't want to. Sure you have. Everybody sure want to show you, you the game. <laughs> I'm saying, no, I'm saying, I'm sure you have because you move around in a lot of different spaces, right? With a lot of different people, decision makers, power brokers, whatever, whatever. But I've seen it. I've seen it in media. I've seen it in politics. I've seen it in business. I've seen it in community organizations. Like the passing of the torch, and this has always been something very passionate for me coming out of uh, organizers' activist space where we constantly, constantly ran up against walls because people did not see the value of younger leadership, more progressive ideas. They did not want to invest the time to really stand with you and to say, you know what, I see something in you that I want to put a little extra something on, taking you under the wings, all of that. We, we have a very serious problem within the black community of doing this. I've seen it time and time again. In my years of working in activism and organizing, 20 plus years, I've seen this time and time again. Even if we, and we've had this conversation in this regard, when we talk about voting for people, I've had, the, I had one little young brother, he was like in his 20s, he was mayor of a small town in the South. And, you know, he's open to it. But the fact that a lot of us, we're still not completely sure that when we see a 25 year old, 30 year old, 35 year old, whether they can do a certain job, we still question their credentials. Yeah. We question the only thing we don't question is necessarily is their passion, but we question whether they're going to stand the test of time, their longevity, right? And I and, and it's so sad, it's so sad. And I mean, yeah, it's it's Reverend very Jackson has been around thing. for. Say it again. I say no. It's very common. It's very common. It's we very not, common. We can sugarcoat, but let's just be real. We want to assume that everybody wants to replicate themselves, but that's not. I have not found that's that. not the truth. Uh, in the law, come on, come on, talking to my soul. In politics, you're that you say, you would think people would want to open doors, high five you. Hey, no, 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 no. That's no, a very you know rare spirit. It exists. There are great hey, look, people. Hey, look, let me add something. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, let's let's just throw a little more. Uh, let's throw a little bit more fire into this, and then we're gonna take our next pause. You, we, we are super liberal and progressive until it comes to that position. Then we get real conservative. I'm going to say that again. We get super liberal and progressive. We talk the ideas. We talk about next year. Roger, don't get me in trouble, Roger. Don't get, let's go to the don't get me in trouble. Listen, <laughs> let me tell you. Because I've seen it. And it's, it's really about progressive all and liberal. To, oh my. All the way until, until you're talking about, hey, man, you're going to uh, step down. Then we become conservative and Republican as hell. They won't even let you be their assistant because they're afraid. It's real. I, let's take a break, Friday. Let's, let's take a break. Let's take a break, folks. <laughs> <laughs> folks, we got to take a quick pause when we come forward. Let's continue the conversation. What's your take on this, crew? We're talking about passing the torch. We're talking about uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Haynes stepping down from leadership at the Rainbow Push Coalition. I would love to hear what you got to say, crew. Post your comments in the chat, and let's continue to talk about it. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause 
too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, joined by, joined by uh, my sister, Suzette Speaks, as we talk about uh, Pastor Frederick Haynes III stepping down as the leader of Rainbow Push, Push excuse me, Rainbow Push Coalition, <laughs> only after three months of being in the position. There were such high hopes and a lot of excitement and great expectations for the pastor to 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 lead this civil rights organization in the in in the future and then unfortunately this happened with this surprise announcement that came down yesterday let me share with culture crew members are saying tiana you said i encountered this situation when i was a union rep none of the senior members wanted me to be union reps yes we see this all the time we see this all the time. Lana, my sister, you said vote them all out. It's falling. <laughs> and they are the cause. His children didn't even want to, speaking of Reverend Jesse Jackson, or his wife, if that isn't a sign. Wow. Cindy D, you said, can Rainbow Push keep hope alive? <laughs> Reverend Jesse Jackson did. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very real. And Vic Wicked, Vic, my guy, you said the old God don't want to move out the way got to move and let the new leaders lead. And and again, this is all speculation because, and, and, and here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem. And this is what, um, and I think who else, I think I saw Taylor Taylor, you made this point saying that why don't we invite uh, um, Pastor Haynes to come on to the show to speak. He's his, not going to speak. He's a, he's a high road type of dude. He's That's why we are having to speculate. <laughs> that's right. I know that's he a great put out point. A statement. We could, but we would if we could. Yeah, absolutely. right, right. He put out a statement. It just broke yesterday, so he put the statement out. He's not going to speak. I'm gonna tell you. I, I know this new stuff a little bit, y'all. The man is not going to speak. Now, will he go into detail? We probably never will find out what actually happened behind closed doors. He's not going to speak. And so, can he quash the Grimmel Taylor Taylor? Taylor? Like, I mean, he could if he's if he speaks out. But the problem is, we don't know is, if there's any kind of NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, those type of that's things. Very so real. That's why, again, sometimes again, people in the organization leak stuff more so than the individuals. Right, 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 who right. Are involved directly. Uh, I saw other comments in the chat. Shout out to the chat. And um, let me get my math right. Forty years, forty plus years for Doctor Hayes. Fifty years right. of existence for Rainbow Push. Sorry, math wasn't bad then. But um, looking at it, I think it was uh, who who suggested why didn't one of his kids take it up? Uh, it, it sounds like, or based on reports, uh, Jackson's uh, Reverend Jackson's son, Yusuf Jackson, will serve as the chief operating office officer of Rainbow Push. Not sure if that will be a permanent or temporary, but uh, that was a statement that was released by the organization and after they had accepted uh, Dr. Haynes' re resignation. But we we know though that there are certain things that. Again, it doesn't have to be specific to this particular instance, but that are issue of to our community as a whole. But this one, it hits home for so many of us because uh how we've seen it play out in real life. I think it was Pastor Damon Blissett say, hey, it was in church like this, too, when it comes right. to the pastor and going through to the next pastor. It's like they have to be uh, almost, you know, on their deathbeds to give way for and then we need the mentorship new leadership to be mentored and to be uh brought up so that they understand you know what what goes on with all this responsibility but instead there is always uh i don't know this kind of vacuum kind of mentality well when i'm gone y'all figure it out but we it, we can't make 
enough progress with that type of mindset and mentality. But yeah, I think if you talk to millennials, if you talk to, uh, and I think it's Gen Y and Z, this is yeah. very common. This is very common. And again, not everybody has this spirit, so we're not going to paint everybody uh, from our, our our brothers and sisters who are, I guess, uh, older boomers and greater generation. But there, I, I think I, I have maybe a theory as to why, because sometimes I think within our community, a lot of times we might have the public visibility, but we may not have the financial stability of our counterparts. So when you think of, you know, counterparts, for example, in the white community that maybe can give way and step aside so that you have three and four generations of like, say, for example, large companies like Ford and other companies, you know, their family plans for this. Succession yeah. plan is a thing. Um, yeah, but absolutely. Reason, maybe we have a more... Uh, and that might not be in every case, but I was just thinking aloud as far as economic challenges that prevent us from wanting or allowing us to have others step forward in a timely fashion so that the transfer of knowledge goes forth in a, in a, in a way that allows the next generation to benefit from having, you know, the pastor emeritus or, or whoever. But we struggle with that, Suzette. So it's, it's real, it's real. It's, it's a real struggle. And Brother Damon said, for Raji, Suzette, many pastors died in the pulpit. That's the shame. And, 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 I mean, and I'm glad pulpit. you brought that up, Brother Damon, <laughs> yeah. because that is a real shame. We see it not just in the church, we see it in the civil rights organizations, political organizations, businesses, as you pointed out. That's a shame. Because you can't say, well, I'm all in. I'm all in for next generation. I'm all in for, for opening the doors and stuff. And then you don't really properly prepare. And and, and it's it's really, it's, you know, because of my years of seeing this, I, it's nothing, it's not about money. It's not about status. It's not about politics. It's the heart. Mm. It's the heart, man. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't give up the ghost in your mind in Some people mind, you think that's the only thing that you're the only person that can do the job the way you do it. It's the heart. You know what I'm saying? And 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 this is the type of stuff. I mean, we, we think this is not a, a black thing. Hell, we're looking at this with the president right now. <laughs> well, this is this is this is something with the heart. Uh, Stephanie Humphrey channel. You checked in. Good to hear from you, sis. You said. If you don't mind, I don't think it looks bad. Sometimes things feel right at the time, but once we get into the inner workings, we see it is it isn't right for us. It's not uncommon. I don't think That's it reflects very bad true. on Dr. Haynes. I don't think so. I think it actually reflects kind of bad on or may be interpreted to be a problem with the organization. For a man again who has spent 40 some years pastoring, senior pastoring over 13,000 members you know, successfully kind of impacting his community where he was, I agree with you. Sometimes when you step into a situation, you realize, whoa, this is again, because there was no transition, so to speak. You're like, wait a minute, look at this. This is a way bigger elephant than I could chew, like one piece at a time. So maybe this isn't for me. Again, a lot of the leaders around the person make it makes a big difference too. So whether you have that support once you step into that role, I think also can make a difference, not only in this case, but just in cases of transition in general. But yeah, I do think, I don't know, you might question him, but I think more people will probably question the, or what's going on at the organization, rightfully or wrongly. But I think it doesn't, to me, three months, that 90 days, he was like, no, 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 no. Uh, let me go back to my pool. That's bit. the point. Hey, hey, Suzette. Let's see what's up. Yeah. Just to throw a little levity into conversation. That's only a probation period. <laughs> He's saying, you know what? My man <laughs> said at the end of the probationary <laughs> period, I'm out. I'm done. And and I mean, maybe it just wasn't, it could be personalities. It could be so many different things. We just don't know. Things. But I, I do it's, think it's, it makes a difference for a lot of us um, who are seeking leadership. And everybody, oh, you got you to step out there. You got to go out there. I'm talking about in law practice, the amount yeah. of people that have not <laughs> been mentors, when they talk a good game, they'll have lunch with you. But that's about it. And I wonder sometimes, too, when I've had conversations with friends that talk about, you know, maybe they came up on the rough side and it took them 20 years to figure out the game. And they think you need to spend that time instead of giving you, I don't even call it the keys to the kingdom, but any type of um, shortcut to allow you to go forward. And then others maybe have not really figured out the keys to the kingdom and don't want you to know they haven't figured it out. 
So I've had that type of uh, situation too, especially in law practice really? where going, trying to figure out, especially in the beginning, how to do things. And people were just really mean and kind of all over the place. Yep. But several people came back to me and was like, Sue, maybe she don't want you to know what's going on in her office for real, for real. Like there's so many different parts of why things yep. may not work out. But I do think this is an, a larger trend Agreed. that needs to be addressed in a healthy dialogue. As to yep. why, again, all I'm saying is I've had conversations to many friend groups about this. And shout out to those who do open doors, who do mentor, who do sponsor, and are are willing to work alongside and help another person of a different generation come through the door. We appreciate you. And but look, again, very quickly, quickly, I, I agree through. with you 1,000% on that analysis, and I agree with you. And I'm going to just say this before we take our next pause. Just because you are older or you're an elder doesn't mean you are a mentor. When you're talking about being. <laughs> I've gone into spaces like, with Faraji where people have said to me, oh, you're here to take my job. And I'm like, hi, nice. To, nice to meet you, too. <laughs> like, you was so. And like, look, no people have, people have said like, that to me. I and I, you know what I always tell the people? I always say this to people, man. What God has for you is for you. I don't want What God your job, has for me man. is for me, bro. I don't need to take your job. I'm a look, 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 look. I, look, I don't know if it's I a work culture or specific to black folks or just you know corporate culture in America. I don't know, man. Please, but I don't need industry, to take nobody's industry, job. It's cut through because man. guess what? I already know who I am and I know what I bring to the table and I'm gonna shine regardless, bro. I hope they. Get that, and we all do better at this. But no, this I, I, know, I over the last one you're talking about. I've had this from the very beginning, where people like, "Oh no, 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 you're bigger than this position. Let me give it to somebody else." And I'm like, "Why wouldn't you? Know, <laughs> you know?" But they don't want you in their business, and they don't want right, to learn right, right, early. right. It's kind of scary, and it that's my experience. Scary. Other people Absolutely. Can but let me just let let it's it's going to see. We're going to see if there's going to be any more conversations. But I'm a, I'm a, I'm not going to hold my breath. Yeah. That we're going to hear something from Reverend Jackson or from some, you know, interim person. I don't think we may never hear as to what really happened behind closed doors over these three months. But it does open the discussion for us to have um, deeper, like you said, going back to your point, deeper conversations about succession plans, especially within our black led organizations. That is a conversation that is critical and that we need to constantly have be discussing especially in light of all of the other um, cultural and social changes that are happening in this country. There are so many things happening. We need to have fresh leadership in a lot of different spaces, and we need to have people there that's going to open the doors, make the ground fertile for that to happen. But we will have to see how this thing plays out. Uh, look, folks, we got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, let's switch gears a little bit more. On the other side, uh, I want to talk to us about uh, how there are – a, a number of black uh, black alumni from the University of Florida who are actually calling on the, the, the school to reinstate this DEI policy. Suzette brought this to my attention. It's happening down in her neck of the woods. We'll talk a little bit about that. Also on the other side, in the second half of the show, we'll talk about Black Maternal Health Week and give you some ways and give you some insight as to some of the challenges and ways that black mothers can make sure that they stay safe and healthy uh, during pregnancy. We'll have that conversation as well. Stay with us. A lot to cover in the second half of the culture right here on the Black Star Network. We wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. This is an opportunity for us to be able to speak to our issues. Y'all better understand something real quick. We ain't going nowhere. It is a continual battle that we see all of, uh, across this country. Revolution will not be televised. The revolution will be streamed. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. He makes sure that our stories are told. Roland Martin's doing this every day. You can't be black on media and be scared. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. to 
remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. And if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. All right, folks, welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, joined by my sister, Suzette Speaks. And, folks, we've had a fantastic first half of the show as we talk about everything from the January 6th riots and that obstruction law to what happened at Rainbow Push Coalition. And, folks, and uh, Suzette, so many people are checking in and having their say on that particular topic. But, again, we will continue to have do our due diligence to have those conversations here on the Black Star Network around succession plans and leadership and so much more. Now, folks, if you're just tuning in, we are streaming on a number of different platforms. Make sure you go to our home website at blacksawnetwork.com. Download the app for free. Follow us on social media. And more importantly, drop something in a bucket as we are looking for investors and stakeholders in this great mission we are embarked upon of breaking Black news and content like never before in the digital space. So your support makes a world of difference. And we thank all of those who have already donated to us here on Black Star Network. But again, you can do that at blackstarnetwork.com. Uh, Suzette, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in your neck of the woods. University of Florida Black alumni are now calling for the reinstatement of DEI programs as a way to bring some, uh, to level the playing field for black college students down there at the University of Florida. What, what, what's going on? How did this, how did this all kick off? So we had a bill recently passed by our Republican controlled state legislature that and now prevents state funds to, from being used by state run public universities for DEI programs. So when we think of DEI now, this, this um, attack has affected some of the largest institutions, including uh, the state's flagship institution, the University of Florida, where um, I will, in full disclosure, <laughs> I attended UF Go Gators and have seen, you know, even throughout my time there, the difficulties that uh, Black students have had in just finding their place and finding their home and leaving successfully with a degree and with hopefully the same benefits of a network and a wonderful education that every other student that attends the university will have. In this instance, uh, the legislation does not preclude private funds from being used for DEI programs. So uh, even in the discussions I've had with, you know, folks who were on the um, Tallahassee Hill lobbying and trying to uh, prevent this legislation from going forward, I, I brought up the, the discussion around what about black student unions? What about black, historically black, you know, fraternities and sororities? Do, do those count as DEI, you know, organizations and initiatives? And it's not really to me clear still um, that they're not under threat because they are, have been saying certain state legislators have been saying, oh, no, it doesn't include uh, historically black fraternities and sororities and, and BSUs and things like this, uh, black student unions. However, there are a lot of wraparound organizations and faculty and programs, one of which I was a part of, that help sustain uh, first-time uh, college students at these uh, universities, especially at the University of Florida, right? There are uh, programs, and they might be in other uh, states as well, called AIM, and I was a part of a program called PACT, designed for Black students, again, who were first time in college, who did not even understand the lay of the land and the intricacies of what it meant to be a college student, how to organize yeah. your finances, how to organize your schedule, how to do things with, you know, from registration to financial aid, how to navigate the campus. Thank goodness those programs were in place. For me, I was on campus a week before in um, a class packed with uh, other minority students, predominantly Black students trying to figure out how to be a student. And all of us, it was so wonderful to have that experience, to first and foremost all already kind of develop this kind of unity among a cohort 
of folks just like you, freaked out just like you. Uh, we we knew the campus before other students went there. We understood the bus route. We understood the dining hall. We understood all the things that go with being a college student. That if we were dropped off there, I've had friends that didn't have any DEI support or any other programs that I had the benefit of, and they talked about even their freshman year crying, like their parents just left them and they had no clue really what to do. They tried to follow a couple roommates. What, what are you guys doing? What is next? What should I be doing now? This is a, a, a quite a daunting experience if you don't have anybody else in your family who has gone to college. Nonetheless, in this article, and we can bring it up, uh, one of my colleagues, mentors, friends, the first black president of the Florida Bar Association, that's the head of all the lawyers, 111,000 of us in Florida, the first black man to hold that position, black person, uh, the distinguished Mr. Eugene Pettis. He's a brother of Kappa Alpha Psi. He's a mentor. He has started so many DEI programs. Even the one he has started under the Florida Bar is under attack. Mm. But he has now uh, made public statements on behalf of a group of uh, the black alumni of the University of Florida to say, we need to do something, UF, raise this money. Uh, he has put out the number of 45 million to create or recreate, <laughs> reestablish yeah. the things that were already there. Yeah, um, let's and, let me take let me share this sure. with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, this is called this is coming from the new group calling itself the Coalition of Concerned Black University of Florida Alumni. And they are asking, and this is comprised of more than a hundred black graduates of the school. And these are just three of the big points that they're asking for, folks. Take a look. Dedicating that $45 million, as you spoke about, Suzette, from the school's $2.4 billion endowment. There we go. Damn. To re-implement diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. The second thing is appoint a Black University of Florida graduate to the school's board of trustees. And the third thing is boost efforts to, include, to increase its declining Black student enrollment and hire more black faculties. I absolutely love this, Suzette. I love it. I love it when 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 organizations, groups come together and they lay out two to about three to five different points that they want to focus on. It gives us a clear look as to what they want to do. This is this is big. But that $2.4 billion endowment, that's what got my attention right there. We like, got the money what? now. If they have the will to spend it. But yeah, I, I after we take this break, I can talk a little bit more about this because it's so yeah. because UF is the 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 flagship. Now, shout out to FSU and my brother went to FSU. Everybody gonna be mad because I say this, but this is the hardest school to get into here in our in our in our in our uh, state and even beyond, right? So the access this particular university grants to, again, a different network of people. Some people say you're going to college for the education. Oftentimes, it's the network that those Harvard people are paying for, right? The education is one piece, but the people that you get to know and become friends with that you end up going along life with for the rest of your life is super important as well. So when we look at uh, that access, when we were there, it was 5% and 3% of the total student body being Black. Uh, now, I, students who I know with very high GPAs, black students cannot get in, and it's not that they're as uh, uh, not as qualified. But again, the the admissions officers that we that I had when we were there uh, happened to be uh, a combination of people, including Hispanic and black, and they could look at students holistically. Again, some of those things now have been changed thanks Supreme Court and now. Florida legislature signed by Ron DeSantis. So we have to work around this and find yes. the private money. Absolutely. Folks, we got to take another quick pause. When we come back, let's continue the conversation on the other side. You tune into the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits.
We wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. This is an opportunity for us to be able to speak to our issues. Y'all better understand something real quick. We ain't going nowhere. It is a continual battle that we see all uh, across this country. Revolution will not be televised. The revolution will be streamed. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. He makes sure that our stories are told. Roland Martin's doing this every day. You can't be black on media and be scared. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, joined by my sister, Suzette Speaks. As we talk about what Black uni, uh, University of Florida alumni are calling for and asking for in the, in the space of DEI, they want DEI programs and initiatives to be reinstated at the University of Florida. And they have decided to create a new group of alumni, about 100 graduates of the University of Florida, Black graduates, have decided to come together, organize, pool their resources, and call the university to make some changes, taking just a little small part out of their $2.4 billion endowment and dedicating about $45 million to DEI initiatives and, and programs there at the school, and also getting a seat at the table for Black graduates to be heard and seen and the impact to be felt. And, and you know, when I when I think about this, Suzette, my thinking is, you know, how, how what's the likelihood, what is the probability that the University of Florida will comply to any one of those demands that was laid out by the black uh black alumni at the University of Florida? Well, well, this initially is a letter, but I think UF responds to more so action. If yeah. you show up on their front door, how did, how did how's it go? Um, it's going to take a little bit more than this. I think the advocacy is great, and I'm grateful to be a, a part of it. I want to just point out, Faraji, that since the implementation of this new law that is preventing uh, state funding, public funding for DEI positions at public universities, uh, we saw at the University of Florida the elimination of 13 full-time positions in wow. response to the law that was signed by Governor DeSantis, which bars universities from using state or federal money for programs that advocate, quote, for diversity, equity, inclusion, or quote, promote or engage in political or social activism. That's very broad. That's, That's very, very broad. broad yeah. Right. So me being a former member of our student government association back in the day, you know, all those clubs, <laughs> you know, the organizations were from uh federal funds, right? Uh some of them also came from, you know, student activity and service fees which has, can be distinctive because the students are paying for it as a fee to go to the school. Um, but there are some, again, uh, there was Institutes of Black Culture. I'm like curious now, I have to go do my research. Are these things still there? We had his uh, Hispanic Culture um, Institute as well. Uh, but it made such a difference to the success of students by having these uh, supportive uh, and auxiliary staff members as well as you know uh, programs. To, to support them. Again, it is very difficult for a person who does not and has never had any kind of college experience or anybody in their family hasn't had any college experience to go and be successful and say, here, this is how it goes. Uh, you need these things. Shout out to, and, and I'm thinking about the, the, the folks who helped desegregate UF. Uh, I think about uh, folks who helped desegregate UF's law school um, and, the, and the deans that we had. And this is like, uh, to, now, I guess they were around from the 90s, 2000s, and the early 2010s. Shout out to uh, men like uh, uh, Mike Powell, Dean Mike Powell, Walter Robinson, rest in peace, Dr. Shaw, uh, rest in peace, Dr. Scott. There were strategically like Black men who were leading in the administration such that, again, it, ma it matters who was in the leadership of any organization, but at a, at a top tier university, they could um, uh, promote a vision that allowed for them actually having, you know, the uh, power in the admissions uh, process, power in the dean of students role to actually support the students that they know would need more support in terms of how uh, they apply programs and funds so that all students have the same opportunity of being successful. But without these 
specific faculty members, specific programs. When I, when I think about all of us who graduated together and how important it was to have these faculty members when you had problems in your class, I knew I could go to Dean Scott. I knew I could go to Dean Shaw when I needed letters of recommendation, when I needed, you know, to figure out how to deal with a, a, a rogue teacher or, you know, um, teacher assistant. You know, they were our sounding boards. These were our home away from home, our, our, our parental figures that made sure that we were, were sustained and had the best access to resources, just like every other student. But because we didn't have that institutional knowledge based in our families, we would yeah. have, many people would have not been as successful as we are now. So I, I applaud again, this effort. It might take some some rallies. I'm not sure uh, where it will go from here, but it's important again to have leadership input and that admissions process leadership input yeah. to make sure, like I said, the 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 one in two percent of of the entire undergraduate student body being uh, black is is not uncommon. And again, this is the top school. <laughs> here in, in um, Florida and beyond. Uh, some would say the South, some would say Harvard of the South. You know, it depends who you ask, but bottom line right. is everybody this looking at the number of black people in Florida, why wouldn't our public institutions reflect the people that they're designed to serve? And so we have a bigger issue. My tax dollars, those who live in Florida, residents who pay taxes in Florida are looking at funding, you know, institutions like UF and unfortunately, they, they are public institutions that are not reflected of the needs of the public that they're supposed to serve. So that becomes a bigger issue. And I think we're going to get louder about it. Uh, but I think this is a very good first step, laying out demands that are, are, are concrete and attainable for the university now saying in the statement, and I'll just read what their spokesperson said through a UF spokesperson, university was required to quote, uh, she says, uh, Cynthia Rolden in an email said the university is quote, uh, required to follow the law. And the obligation to our students is to make sure that everyone is welcome. The University of Florida is and will always be unwavering in our commitment to universal human dignity. What does that mean, ma'am? As opposed, Anyway, so through university spokeswoman, Cynthia Rolden. So Emmett Smith is also a UF alumni member who um, has blasted the NFL great. Emmett Smith has blasted yeah. UF's decision about uh, diversity and inclusion. There's other, some high other, um, profile, you know, Haslam. There are people that they're trying to bring in to bring, give this the, the gravitas it deserves. And it's going to take the Black alumni <laughs> to come together, more than 100, and it's building, uh, to come together to make our voices known and to, to, to push the university to give the money that they're sitting on, right? We're not asking right, for right. $2 billion, we're asking for $45 million of the $2 billion to reinstate these uh, positions and to, to make this a welcoming, as they say, a welcoming campus for everyone. And, 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 I, and I'm sure that for those black and alumni like yourself and others, it, 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 I'm sure y'all are thinking about if this is pulled off, if something of, of benefit comes to black students, black alumni from this effort, that this could be a model that could be used on other college campuses in states that challenge DEI in, in some way respect. Now we know Florida, how where Florida stand, but then you still got a lot of other states that are questioning the value, the importance of DEI. And I think this right here just gives us even more context to that, that I've seen some black folks who are expressing, oh, DEI, that's nothing, that's not important stuff, but you're not understanding the, the network, rather, not the network, but the implications the implications of how having laws around diversity, equity, inclusion include those from the, not just black people from America, includes women. It includes our people, our brothers and sisters coming from the Caribbeans and, 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 and who emigrated like themselves to, to this part of the world, uh, to this part of the globe, right? Like it includes so many other different pieces. So we got to get out of this tunnel vision of saying, oh, it's, not, it's this DEI that you're talking about opening up the space and having these conversations, having programs and initiatives that's going to benefit other people outside of Black Americans, but they're still going to be considered Black. It's real simple. They're still going to be considered Black. And of course, like I said, women, for Black women, what, what happens to Black women and when they want to, when y'all decide to say, hey, you know what, I want to do this, I want to do that but you don't have the policy, you don't have 
the support that you need. You don't have the foundation to work from. And so, you know, it, it opens up that conversation. But I hope, I really do hope that those brothers and sisters, your colleagues see like, you know, they, they get some support. We're, we're going to do it on our part here on Black Star Network. We're bringing it up. But at the end of the day, awareness and actually getting some stuff done, two different things. 100%. I agree with you. Two different things. So it's, it's, it's something that we're going to keep our eyes on. Folks, we got to take another quick pause. When we come forward, let's switch gears talking about black women. Let's talk about that this week is Black Maternal Health Week. And we're going to be checking in with our sister Esther McCant to talk to us about how the work that she's doing is bringing uh, safety and security to pregnant black women. Stay with us. That conversation is up next here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, joined by my sister, Suzette Speaks. And Suzette, um, you've got another special guest. I love when you bring people on. Absolutely love it, Suzette. So you have a very special guest that you wanted us to um, talk to as we have this conversation, as we do our part to recognize uh, Black Maternal Health Week. And, And folks, I want you to do the same thing as well make sure y'all check out all the latest news and information about why it's important for us to have black maternal health week and why is there is important for us to have these conversations and we are going to be joined by a very very special guest assistant that is doing her part to make sure that black women are getting the necessary support and they are found safe during that time of pregnancy And I want to bring my sister Suzette back on very quickly and to introduce our uh, next guest. Uh, Suzette, this is a sister you brought to our attention. So I was like, let's talk about it. It's important. Who who are we going to have joining us in a few moments? Esther McCant. She's the founder of the Metro Mommy Agency here in South Florida. I I know her in real life and I've watched her blossom. And for those who don't know, we've been celebrating Black Maternal Health Week this past week. And for if you have never heard of it, it's kind of a new uh, in the last few years, maybe three or four years creation. And I want her to talk a little bit about what she does. Uh, She is a doula. If you don't know what a doula is, she will explain how uh, we have had, especially as black women, a rich history of midwifery in this country and helping bring uh, uh, babies into this world. But unfortunately, that history has been kind of interrupted. So she, among many others, are working to create safer uh, deliveries for Black mothers. We can um, put the statistic up, if you don't mind, about uh, what we're looking at currently. Uh, currently, Black women are three times more likely, according to the, to the CDC, to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. Multiple factors contribute to these disparities, such as a variation in quality, health care, underlying chronic conditions, structural racism, and implicit bias. Social determinants of health prevent many people from racial and ethnic minority groups from having fair opportunities for economic, physical, and emotional health. So we want to talk about what we can do to disrupt that pattern with yep. Ms. Esther McCant. Esther, welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. How are you feeling this afternoon, sis? Oh, we got you on mute? I'm doing wonderful. I'm so grateful to be here on this call with you all today. Thank you to everyone who's here to listen and to learn. I'm happy to be here and thank you for having me. Well, I thank Suzette for inviting you, and uh, it sounds like you're doing some phenomenal work with uh, Metro Mommy Mommy Agency, and uh, that's the website, folks, and we want you to 
you know, check that out to get more information about how you can, uh, if you find yourself pregnant or if you have a friend or family member that is pregnant to get some real, real good uh, information about uh, making sure that they stay safe and supported during this time. Um, so what was the, my question, and I don't want to take up the conversation because I want, this is all about you and Suzette and everything, but I do want to just throw this off there to start. What was the inspiration in, in, in creating uh, mommy, the Metro Mommy Agency? Oh, wow. So definitely my children. I'm actually a mom of four. And okay, awesome. Yeah. And I had them all with midwives, all out of the hospital birth setting. And mm -hmm. so while I can empathize with what we're experiencing here in America, I actually did, did not have the experience that Black women are having here. I had wonderful support from someone who listened to me. The midwife was very intentional about making sure I had childbirth education. Um, and because I lived in Florida, we have the luxury of having access to three different types of midwives here. We have licensed midwives, certified professional midwives, and we also have uh, certified nurse midwives here. Mm. And so I had a licensed midwife here in Florida and I found myself in my third pregnancy living outside of Florida in Alabama. And mm. if you know anything about Alabama, um, it's a little, it's, it's a lot of bit racist. Um, and <laughs> Wait, I like how you said that. <laughs> And Look at face. <laughs> yeah, I make faces. I do. I'm very expressive. And I found myself feeling like this is probably going to be a different scenario if I even dared to try. Because at the time, this was back in like 2015 um, or so, 2014, I'm sorry, where it was actually illegal for me to go and seek care from a midwife in Alabama because I absolutely had to have an OB present or else that midwife could lose their license. Mm. So we had those types of regulations. Um, and a lot of that still persists today. We have um, a wonderful black midwife, doctor midwife out in Alabama trying to build a birth center. And she's facing similar, you know, racist, very discriminatory practices in Alabama. So long story short, I knew enough about birthing in Florida to say, hey, I know I have options. I went to UM, I got a degree. I know I can choose what I would like to have when it comes to my birth. And I don't have to, uh, you know, just, you know, settle for less. So I did my research and I found a midwife in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I don't know if anybody... Yeah. Let's see. Um, hey. <laughs> but they have some freer laws there and more midwives there. And so I was able to access a midwife there who helped me to see after I gave birth. It was a wonderful six hour labor, uh, water birth experience. She helped me to see um, at my five week appointment that despite the fact that I moved three times in the pregnancy, despite the fact that um, I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm just a mom, I'm a black mom, and I have three kids, what am I doing with my life? She made me ask questions, right? Deeper questions to help me understand I have a purpose. And I knew my purpose was being on the playground, talking to these moms about birth, helping them navigate their own birth experience, uh, helping them process birth trauma. Um, and because of that, she said, while I was crying about what am I going to do with my life, she said, consider becoming a doula or a midwife or, a, you know, childbirth educator. And so I chose doula back in 2015. And since then, I've been, you know, running and, and in this work, deep in this birth work. Um, and this is where I choose to stay. So. That is awesome. I'm proud of you, sis. Talk about what a doula is. We don't want to leave anyone out and um, what you do to train them through your company, Metro Mommy Agency. Absolutely. So a doula is a trained professional who can support you prenatally during your pregnancy and also support you during the birthing process. So they're by your side or at your bedside, helping you get comfortable, relax, uh, breathing techniques, helping you to focus on making clear decisions and um, ensuring that you have what we call informed consent uh, before you decide on any interventions. And then we also uh, provide what we call postpartum doula support support in home, visiting you at home, checking in, how are you doing, adjusting with your newborn, adjusting with breastfeeding and infant feeding, and just, you know, how are you doing with your feelings, right? How are you really doing? We get to answer that question. Um, and 
this is something traditionally we've known uh, when we think about our culture and black culture period, we've always had a woman, you know, supporting us when we are giving birth, right? That's kind of what our ancestors did. And so in the same vein, we encourage doulas to be a part of this process, especially in a very medicalized um, system. And so what I'm working on is to address these high infant mortality rates, um, maternal mortality rates, and uh, the fact that these things keep persisting in our Black communities all across our nation and even across the world, the globe, really. Um, and the way that I do that is to say, let's make sure we have enough doulas on hand, on site, trained, ready to go, resilient, um, mentoring these doulas, training them and partnering with other organizations to train them so that we can develop a stronger and larger workforce, right, to fill in the gaps. We don't see the changes in the healthcare system really improving. Um, we've had a lot of shortages, whether it's OBs, um, obstetricians, right? Or nurses that are like per diem or traveling nurses. We don't have stability in our healthcare system right now. And so we need to stop the bleeding. We need to make sure we have emotional support for these families, physical support, and somebody who's always gonna be in their corner and have their best interests in mind. Um, you know, Esther, she said, we got to take another quick pause, but when we come forward, I, I want to know, you know, uh, I know this is a, this is a type of work that speaks to our natural, I would say, getting back to like the, the old school way of having children and just being pregnant. And, and I'm wondering, Esther, are you finding that a lot of black women are now opting for this type of uh, support in pregnancy instead of the traditional Western medicine? Uh, we're seeing a sort of revolution in, in, in this. So I, I want to get your take on that. And um, crew, I wanted you to join us in the conversation as we check in, of course, with our very special guest, Esther McCann from Metro Mommy Agency to talk about how she is doing the work of supporting and making sure that Black women who are going through pregnancy are safe and secure. So folks, post your comments in the chat and we'll continue the conversation on the other side. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, joined by my sister, Suzette Speaks, and Suzette's very special guest, our sister Esther McCant from Metro Mommy Agency. She is the founder of the organization, the agency that is working to support Black women during their pregnancy and, more importantly, providing services, doula services, midwife, midwife services, to make sure that they are going through their pregnancy in the most healthy and safest way. And um, I don't, again, I'm not trying to dominate the conversation here. No, you are. This is good for everybody. See, he does um, something. But, um, but Esther, I'm, I'm wondering, are you finding that there are more Black women, and you could also include other women, women from other, from other places, or other ethnicities, but are you finding that more Black women are starting to reconsider going through this process of having a doula, going through this process of having more natural births, are we seeing the numbers working in that? Is there like a small revolution brewing when it comes to this? Let's say I hope so, um, because right okay. now we still have majority, 98% of births happening in hospital settings, only 2% happening 
outside of hospital settings. And what I have noticed is a focus on the hospitals wanting to incorporate certified nurse midwives into their practice and then their care models, which we know um, is ideal to reduce the risk of uh, maternal mortality and infant mortality um, all over the globe. We know this, right? There's other countries that have made midwifery care the, the standard, right? And so what I have noticed in terms of the focus who are coming to me. And I like to say I've served families from every continent across the globe, um, except Antarctica, right? And right. every single family that comes across, they sometimes have a story to tell about a previous birth experience, um, previous trauma, previous discriminatory practices, racism, feeling not heard, feeling ignored. And so we oftentimes are hearing that story and we are helping to guide them to make better choices about where they're going to choose to give birth. And they trust us. Uh, just jumping in here, talk about the history that Black women in the United States of America have when it comes to being at the bedside of those mm -hmm. who were pregnant for decades, white, Black, otherwise, and mm -hmm. how those sisters, how they got pushed to the sidelines because of the, let's call it the medical establishment, as being seen as not as worthy of the bedside uh, as they once were. Talk about that history and how it changed. Yeah, so, you know, I, I have to always give credit where credit is due. I wanna thank Jamara Amani, a local black midwife here in South Florida, who really put me, you know, put game and let me know um, what it's really like in terms of the history. And what we know is that black women have traditionally in the role of midwives um, supported the birth of not only black families, but also white families. And um, until we had OBs come into the scene and hospital systems come into the scene, it was very normal to have a midwife support a birth at home, right? And so uh, what we have thought, what we saw was that historically, uh, because of these discriminatory practices, there was a lot of propaganda, there were a lot of campaigns that were done to just ensure sure that we could drag Black women, Black midwives, particularly um, in the dirt, right, in the past. And what would happen is they would say things like they were, um, you know, not clean, they, they didn't practice good hygiene. And um, I remember reading about this also in college, uh, in biology, about how the hygiene of, you know, certain doctors, they wouldn't wash their hands when they would touch cadavers, right? Mm. Um, and then they would go and, and, and touch other people. And so we saw um, issues there as well. And I think systemically um, in certain states, right, certain states that are, you know, you know, we have our Southern states and our Southern state issues um, <laughs> where they are heavily populated by Black people, right? And certain practices happen to um, exclude the care that they would ideally need, especially from Black midwives. And so we used to have thousands of uh, midwives here and plenty of Black midwives here in Florida, uh, but now we're down to a very minimal number. You're talking about, I uh, want to say under 40, um, mm. for sure. And we need more Black midwives, you know? And so I just want to encourage those who are watching to, you know, double back and circle back with Southern Birth Justice Network. They're doing some amazing work. They're also part of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, and um, they do a lot of work. They're the ones who originated, of course, the Black Maternal Health Week seven years ago, um, and why we can continue to build and, 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 and organize um, and increase the awareness about Black maternal health here in our country. Um, That's interesting. We, talk about be your, how to get certified because you certify people yeah. via Zoom, via real um, in-person classes, et cetera. Talk yes. about what you're doing and the number of midwives you hope to put out there to the world. Yeah, so midwifery is something that I do want to take a path for myself in the future. Um, but I am currently a doula. I've been a doula for about eight years. I'm a maternal health consultant. And so right now my role is to train and mentor. So I partner with Southern Birth Justice Network to train doulas. Um, I'm hoping to partner really soon with um, uh, March of Dimes and also um, Common Sense uh, Childbirth Institute, also based in Florida, to ensure that we are training 
recruiting more doulas um, to be on the work for, uh, workforce. And so with the mentorship for me, what that looks like is really helping them fast track their careers. It does not have to be a situation where you get trained and then you never get certified, right? We want folks to be able to get certified. Not that certification means that you're a better doula or anything like that, but we know that certain payer structures require it, certain payer structures uh, such as Medicaid, which will cover some doula support in certain states, uh, may require certification. So we want to make sure that economically we're able to stand and sustain ourselves. Um, and then also, I would just say um, it's really important that you know community-based doulas um, are very important to the community in that they're often coming from the community that they're wishing to serve, which means that they're experiencing the same issues that the communities are experiencing. Um, housing issues, transportation, uh, you know, poor access to healthcare, poor access to uh, education that will really you know, advance them. And so we wanna make sure that we are in step with that in terms of providing wages that are livable um, not only here in Florida, but all across. Um, and so we're grateful for changes in California where doulas can get paid $3,000 per client um, and other states that are like following suit. And we're hoping um, states like Florida and those who have high, you know, Black populations can do the same as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me just get a couple of comments from our um, culture crew here. Corinna, our sister, uh, Suzette, she said proper birthing methods aside from laying on your back would avoid women from needing an SO, I can't even say this word. What is the S S P C O? Man, I feel crazy. I can't say this uh, word. Corinna's comment? Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> no, how is the F C P O uh Epi oh, episiotomy. Episiotomy. There we go. When they cut, when they cut, yes. you're right. She said these doctors <laughs> always want to cut us. And, okay. and talk about C-sections too, how the yeah. high level of C-section is often unnecessary. Um, let me tell you why why I really can't stand C-sections, right? So I'm Haitian. Um, shout out to all my Haitians out there. <laughs> um, my mom was uh, able to have uh, three children, right? Two of which were born in Haiti. Right. And God bless Haiti and prayers out for Haiti right now. And when she came to America, she had me right in 1986. I'm an 86er. I can't say baby. And what happened was she ended up having a C-section. Right. And and when I think about why it was necessary, all I could think about is my birthday is on a holiday. I'm a fourth of July baby. Right. And and so sometimes, yes, people are, you know, so lucky to have a vaginal birth on a, on a holiday. But it always it always stuck with me. Why did she have to have that and land in certain morbidities as a result? Right. Things that change the quality of her life, um, things like hypertension and and diabetes. Right. As a result of some of these issues post a cesarean. But I want people to know it is a major abdominal surgery. You don't want to have one unless it's necessary. Um, and when people elect to do so, you want to make sure that you're um, in a healthy place, that you yeah. understand where your hemoglobin levels are, because there's going to be some expected blood loss. And we, we just want to make sure that folks understand on the other side of the really high cesarean rates um, is the reality that there are many people who are still having vaginal births here successfully. And so as a doula, my role is to make sure that we bring back the joy to the birthing experience. Um, so I use things like hypnobirthing, which is a technique. It's an international program that helps people have calmer, peaceful, relaxed birth experiences. People who are like sleeping through the contractions, um, smiling uh, while they're birthing their babies and breathing their babies downward. Those are ways in which we help to reduce the risk of a cesarean. That's and wonderful. we also know having a doula present helps as well. And, and also midwifery care as well. That is dope. I'm a, I'm yeah. learning, so that's why I'm, I'm yeah. trying to stay quiet because I'm learning. But and that I, is dope. Yeah. I want to ask her to be positive for our last couple minutes here because mm -hmm. this also plays in the psyche of Black women. Faraji as it's dangerous for me to have a baby. No, it's not. Now mm -hmm. our morbidity rates are Report. higher, but Report. we still should be having kids if it's our choice. So mm -hmm. I want to talk about some of the progress, Esther, and some of the positive outcomes that you've seen as a doula so that people know there are ways that they can uh, improve their healthcare outcomes by using services like yours or others uh, when they decide to go through the birthing process. 
Yeah, absolutely. So when you decide to go with a doula, we're going to make sure that in that initial consultation, we're listening for red flags. We're kind of already creating the plan that we might have should you decide to move forward. And then we are also asking you to incorporate your village, your support system, who's going to be um, rubbing your back um, in the event that you know we have to step into the bathroom for a second, right? Like who's going to be rubbing your back at home before we arrive to support you? at home in person, right? And so we want to make sure that you have everything you need in play. Um, the other thing that helps tremendously is if you are in between pregnancies or not yet pregnant on this fertility journey, for example, uh, very important to reach out to doulas because we have different specializations. We have full spectrum doulas who cover the gamut, right? Who can help you with menstruation, help you with all kinds of things uh, to get your body as healthy as possible so that you can maintain a healthy pregnancy pregnancy as well. And then during the birthing process, we're there to support you emotionally, physically, able to help you to identify when you're getting off track, right? And keeping you calm and positive. I've had clients who, you know, we're just jamming out, like we're jamming out to Beyonce, you know, Renaissance, we're doing all kinds of things, right? Um, I've had clients who've <laughs> danced their babies out. I've had clients who've coughed their babies out, right? Um, with little to no effort. And it really just takes a lot of strong mindset uh, pre pre preparation and training. And that's really my specialty. Um, I've done this four times, again, all natural on purpose. And that's the approach that I love to take is let's personalize this. Let's be intentional about all the decisions that we're making. Let's make sure we're clear on what just happened in this last prenatal visit with your provider so that we don't run into a situation that can hinder you from accomplishing your birth plan, right? And, and having the birth experience that, that you want. This is, sounds so good. Um, very quickly, because we only got a few moments left, Esther, but uh, what role does do, do the men in, in the lives of Black women play in this process? Like, whether it's the boyfriend, whether it's the brother, or whether it's the husband, you know, if, if should, how should we, what, what should we do? Should we yeah, be like saying seconds. to the woman, hey, <laughs> maybe you should get a midwife, maybe you should get a doula, maybe, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, what role do men play in this process? Oh my gosh, shout out to the man who booked me before their partners knew they needed to book me. Let's shout out Ooh, to them come who on. identified that, yo, this is a little bit too much, right? I could see her, she's really stressed out. This burden person is stressed out. You can help to reduce the stress by pulling us in sooner than later. Don't be last minute with it, right? Stop thinking about, oh my gosh, it's such an investment. It costs so much. If you can, if you can swing it, swing it. Stop overspending on the baby showers and the gender reveals and, and forgetting that the life is important, that you need an mm. advocate in the room. Stop skipping out on going to the actual educational classes. Learn also yourself as well, right? Be included in the process and stop allowing the medical system and those providers to ignore you. Speak up when you're in that room, right? Listen, take notes, ask questions, right? And those are some of the ways that I know partners can be involved and have been involved um, in the process. You're you dropped the mic right there. And Thank you. Dropping the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Excellent work, sis. Thank you for all that you're doing to train up doulas. Remember, you can take classes by Zoom too. Shout out to you. What's the what's the website so people can get in touch with you? Yes, Metro Mommy Agency.com. It's there. You'll find all the information you need. Click book a doula, fill out that interest form, schedule a consult with me. You will talk to a real person, not AI. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate you coming by. Thank you. Well, Sister, thank Very you so much for the, for the work you're doing. And um, I think uh, Suzette and I will both say thank you for being so good for the culture. There's so much conversation that, uh, you know, I had so many other questions and based on what the crew was saying, but, you know. We can come back. She can come back. <laughs> yeah, she can come back. She can definitely come back and continue it. But thank, thank you, you so much. Thank we you so much. It. Absolutely. Man, oh, man. Ooh. That was that was very informative. Yeah, she was on my YouTube. Y'all want more information? Go watch my show that I did with her last watch night. Suzette, uh, and I'll Suzette put her on the radio, show. so let's go. <laughs> watch, listen to Suzette. Watch Suzette. Nay, Please. But no, she was dope. She was dope. She was dope. No, like, she knows what she's talking about, and I think it will definitely help uh, Black women's 
uh, mortality outcomes to have more practitioners like her. She was telling me about a whole network. There's a lot of people working on this, including Vice President Kamala Harris, who's very passionate about improving Black maternal outcomes. So it's stuff that we need to learn and yeah. share. I like that. And Corinna brought up the fact that Vice President Harris has been more really aggressive and very vigilant about this uh, about about this issue. But I, I'm so happy that she spoke about what men can do because a lot of us are kind of like out of the loop. You know what I mean? And and it's not because we don't care. It's simply because we don't know how to manage that, right? Because especially if you're dealing with a woman who has other women in the family, we assume that this is a thing that y'all know how to do best than, more than us. But we're finding that, and I think this is the important part, we're finding that more and more women are not supported. Whether mm -hmm. they're not supported, they might get a couple of, you know, some advice from their mom, but their mother is keen, you know, they, they learn from a different time. The point is, place. even if you do have somebody, you don't have to do it on your own. The doula makes a big difference because when you have oh, a yeah. doctor and you're in the most vulnerable time of your life, you feel like you have to do what the doctor says. And there are other options often to you, but you don't feel strong enough necessarily to speak up. So just know this is an alternative and an addition that can help you, you know, be heard when you're in your your on your birth, birthing journey. That is, that is right there. Excuse that, I appreciate you so much, sis. Thank you. Thank you for bringing on our very special guest, Esther McCann. Folks, the name of the organization is Metro Mommy Agency. Take a look at the website, be a part of the conversation, and more importantly, learn something. Just learn on something Insta. about She's Come on, I there Can is. Doula on Insta, I Can Doula on Insta. There it is right there. All right, Suzette, thank you so much. We'll certainly check you out on your radio show and all that you're doing, but thank you for being so good for the culture. Always a pleasure. Shout out to the culture crew. Great commentary today. Thank you guys for watching. Shout out to Team Replay. We'll see you next week. See you next week. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us. Thank you all so much for joining us and being a part of the conversation. Make sure you go to our website today at blackstarnetwork.com. Download the app for free. Follow us on social media at Black Star Network and give something. If you got something to give and you can give it, please, it makes a world of difference for us. So thank all of you for being investors and stakeholders in the Black Star Network. Also, follow me on social media at The Real Faraji on Instagram at Faraji on X. And I would love to connect with you to build our beloved community. Big shout out to each and every one of you and the culture crew on X platform, YouTube and Facebook. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned up next at 6 p.m. is Roland Martin Unfiltered. As always, never be afraid to challenge what's wrong. Stand for what's right while being yourself in the process. God willing, we'll talk tomorrow for another exciting edition of the culture right here, only here, exclusively here on the Black Star Network. Talk to you later. Peace. Have a great evening.